Welcome to You Can't Laugh At That, the podcast where we take topics that you can't laugh at and find ways to laugh at them in the never-ending quest to prove that anything can be funny. Today's guest is Cleveland comedian Josh Morrow, who is just a great dude, super insightful. This episode is about difficult audiences, a topic comedians will look at and say, "Eh, that's not funny, because there's nothing worse than getting on stage and not being able to make a connection with an audience. So in today's episode, we'll talk about different ways to do that. We'll talk about different types of hecklers and personal stories involving those, and just finding ways to find the funny in not being able to communicate the funny with audiences. Josh Morrow performs all over the Midwest, all over the Ohio River Valley, and his home club is Hilarities. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 22 of You Can't Laugh at That. Don't laugh at this next part. In a world of political correctness and cancel culture, two comedians have risen up to prove that with the right angle, anything can be funny. This is You Can't Laugh at That. Who writes these? Huh? We should have this person locked up and looked at. Live from Golden Ox Studios in Cleveland, Ohio, it's Steve Murs and David Horning on this week's episode. I really hate when people go up and spit on the audience because you're comedian seven and nobody else has done well yet. Like, fucking, that's still on you. Like, either don't go up or try your best. Like, I really, really hate when people will just be like, oh, you guys haven't liked anything all night or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's complete bullshit, by the way, because you can totally, you have a better opportunity of doing good if everybody did bad before you. You have the opportunity of setting yourself apart from everyone else. Let's get this 80th view in on, on this video here. Oh, this is the <laughs> one. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, I don't really get to go to cool places like Chicago, New York, and L.A. My comedy just mostly takes me to the Ohio River Valley. <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of dick jokes in locker up country <laughs> to make a living, man. It's tough. <laughs> Top. But some small towns are amazing. Some small, some little towns have things that just blow your mind. Like my favorite one was Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. If you've never heard of Rabbit Hash, Kentucky, why the hell would you have? But I'm gonna tell you right now, this town is amazing because they've elected a dog as their mayor. I am not shitting you. They elected a pit bull named Brennan Paltrow to run their town. I did what anybody would do. I went and I pet the mayor. Sure, maybe you could pet Mayor Frank Jackson. Gonna have to buy that man a drink first, right? I did. I went I fed that dog a milk bone. Paid $2 to feed the mayor a milk bone. And then there was nothing else to do in Rabbit So got a little day drunk and started wondering what happened to this town. What kind of climate was political situation where you elected a dog as your mayor? You guys, do we still have- It turns out it just ran against a cat named Hillary. (laughs) (laughs) It was real irresponsible with its emails. (laughs) All right, man, my name's Josh Mark. Damn, I could have provided a clip where it does better. How did that, I mean, did you originate that joke while you were in Rabbit Hash? Yeah, man. Like every good bit, that's like completely true story. I was at some casino gig in Kentucky, like right on the Ohio River between Indiana and Kentucky. Um, when they when they book you for the gig, they say Cincinnati, but it's actually like two more hours past that into the middle of nowhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the gig is like, the casino is a boat because that's the only way you could gamble. But the hotel is like the resort is built next to the boat and the boat like never leaves the dock, which I didn't know when I went there. So you're just stuck 
in the middle of nowhere at a bonkers gig for four days. Um, <laughs> and, like, so day three, I just started driving one morning and the next little town was Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. And somebody on the boat had told me about that dog mayor ship, but I kind of just assumed that they were fucking with me, you know? Um, so I went there and you could literally go pet the mayor. Like that's a real thing that I went and did at nine 30 in the morning in this Kentucky town. And, uh, then I went to a winery and got day drunk. And when I got back to the gig, I was literally just like wandering out loud. Like I said, like, how the hell did this happen? Um, but that night when I did the bit for the first time, I never really wrote it out. I was just winging it and talking about like, when I first wrote it, I was really making fun of this town, you know, and like the people in it and it did okay because it was like a local bit to them and they like to make fun of the people in the neighboring town as well, you know? Mm. Um, but once I left that town and tried to do it at another gig, then it was, it just didn't work that way. It was like, I was like picking on people that they were unfamiliar with, you know? Yeah. So how did you, how did you connect, uh, that with them to turn it into a good bit? Right. So then I started changing it to where I would like soften the beginning parts up so that I definitely wouldn't do any political material beforehand or whatever, you know, or mention anything political beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of just without even intentionally doing it, kind of made it to where I was like, Jesus, how bad could it have been? Was it a cat named Hillary? I mean, fuck, you know, because I most of my gigs are in little red towns, you know. So then it became that, which was like a really easy laugh that almost always worked really good in like those kind of settings. But then when winter came, I was back in the city and, uh, you know, most of those little towns only do comedy in the summer. So now I'm back at Hilarities where it's like a more liberal based crowd or whatever, or say any Lakewood gig or most city gigs for that matter. Now, all of a sudden, I sound, because I'm already come off as a hillbilly, now it sounds like I'm really letting Hillary have it, you know, which, like, I did it at Polk Show one time, and I was doing great, man, like, 10 minutes of just doing solid fucking material, and I ended with that, and it was, like, silence. I mean, I could see the panic on Sam's face from the stage, like, you know, <laughs> just completely missed, not, nobody groaned, it was just dead silence, like, no, we are not having that. You know, uh -huh. um, so I quit doing it for a little while. And then recently I figured out like the way I should have been doing it all along is to say, like, now when I end the joke, I say like, oh, I'm in this little towny bar in a, a rabbit hash resident. Like I set up this guy being in the bar next to me. And then I'm like, this guy looks at me and says, ah, I just ran against a cat named Hillary, you know? So now it always works because it's like that guy saying that, not me saying, you know. We've talked about this before on the show where if you take yourself out of the joke, they are okay with it more because it's not you doing it, it's someone else. So yeah, right. definitely right. a theme that we've had before. Right. It's no longer my shitty liberal opinion or my shitty Republican opinion, conservative opinion, depending on how the, I tell the joke. Now it's just a story about a crazy country guy that I met in Kentucky, which everybody can like almost like came around full circle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Create a character sometimes. I mean, yeah. Like Steve said, I mean, sometimes that externalizing it works, but also there are some cases where the opposite is true too, especially if you're talking about something darker when an audience isn't, like, like died died. Joke. it's okay you guys this happened to me you know I'm the one right. That died right now <laughs> two seconds ago on this stage <laughs> yeah um but in the clip that that uh you gave from hilarities there i mean it gets a laugh the the cat named hillary but what i like about well, what i like best about that clip is that you that line kind of pushes them away but you can see just like the confidence in your eyes that the next line is going to bring them back and sure enough yeah. It was real uh, irresponsible with its emails. Like, oh yeah, that was whiskey, a hundred percent. That was me treading water. Like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> oh, was that was that tag? Was that Mostly, tag? yeah. That was like, oh, okay. I sure can't leave on that. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh man, sometimes those are the best, though. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> Where you just like perform yourself into a corner on your closer, and it's like, I need another tag now. <laughs> right, and then, like this is a really d- terrible thing to like brag about. But that also comes from just doing a thousand shitty road gigs in little towns and stuff where like that last line you say is the last thing you're probably ever going to say to those people from a stage. And then I hang out with everybody after the show, you know, mm-hmm. so like you definitely don't want to be the guy that everybody's coming up to with sympathy. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Oh. That's the worst. <laughs> don't worry. We had a guy way worse two weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, that, cool. Awesome. I feel great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, so that, like, that's where that comes from. And just like, it really, and I see it in a lot of other comics that I admire too, where it's like, it does look like bulletproof confidence, but you know, inside they're shit, you know, they're like, oh man, this, I hope this last tag yeah. works or I'm done, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's cool. I appreciate it. At least it came off. Somewhat like I knew what I was doing. Yeah, no, I mean, even, I mean, I watch comics all the time. So, you know, a lot of times you can tell, but it, the body language is everything. So, I mean, just like there, I didn't know that wasn't a written line. It wasn't a planned line. <laughs> and, but it, it's such a good added punchline too, because it's almost like there's no politics here. Like it's a cat that right. was, was on a computer like doing emails. Like they get that right. visual in their mind and that's absurd. Yeah, see, I love political material. If I could just be like a any kind of comic at all, I would love to just do like John Stewart style monologues that are like informative, but also like cut pretty hard. Like I really, that's what I like the most. But also I just never really tried to do that much as a comic because it's hard to get paid in the Midwest when you're offending two thirds of the people that are paying to see you, you know? Right. Right. Um, have you been watching Andrew Schultz's videos? Mm. He's, he's another one. That's just like, he's such a good writer um, that he's like playing both sides of the aisle on, on all of his videos. I mean, he leans a little bit more left, but at the same time, like, these, these political ideologies are all, you know, something that we've made up anyway. So, you know, he right. more punches down on human behavior. And I mean, if you want to interpret it as politics, that's on you. But the, it's just tight joke writing all the way through. All right. Is it like five minute videos. No. Is it he's, like, like Brent Turnunes? No, no. Which is, that's, ooh, that, I actually wrote that down. Uh, I wanted to talk about that. Um, but no, it's not a character. He's just Andrew Schultz. He's just... Okay. Just ripping on the like current events. I mean, you get on his YouTube, they're all on his YouTube, they're on his Instagram. I mean, so there's yeah, he's got some yeah, I'll check him out. I think his most recent one was on like Epstein and and uh Ghislaine Maxwell. Wish her well. I really wish wish yeah. her well. <laughs> kind of funny hey Mr. President, how do you feel about this lady convicted like uh charged with all these sex crimes? Oh, I wish her well. <laughs> that was not part of his uh, pre-briefing meeting where they're like, okay, if I'm sure they didn't expect uh, an interviewer to bring her up. <laughs> so they gave him all the, th- all the talking points to say when people ask these questions. And then he was just like, uh, I wish her well. I don't know. <laughs> you can't laugh at that. You mentioned Brent Terhune, who is, I, I don't even know that much about him. Have you like worked with him before? Do you know him? Yeah. The last time I did a gig with him, he gave me these, four cookies and I ate them all. And then he was like, those were like 50 milligrams a piece. So oh last I, did the film, I was very, very high at a casino in the middle of West Virginia, but Brent or he, he's funny, man. He's really funny. He was on, when we did those JFL showcases, I met him on that. I think it was the first okay. time I worked with him. If you don't know about Brent Terhune, he is, I mean, he looks like a redneck and he, leaned into that and he does this like faux Trump supporter um, like parody character. This is a character of like yeah. a mega character you know. Yeah. What, do you watch all of his I've videos? I've seen a handful of them and I you know 
we like talked about it at that gig. We were there for like the whole weekend, so we bullshit about a lot of comedy stuff, obviously. Um, but yeah, they really blew up since then, like in the last six months or so. He's like really done a really good job with them. I think I worked with them in January. Is it the last time I worked with them? Okay. Um, what are your what, what is your take on his uh, on his style in those videos? I, I mean, I think they're funny. I, I like them. I guess I don't have any high horse to be on here. I really like them. I think they're humorous. And I think it's funny how many people are so brainwashed that they, they're like, yeah, he's right. That's he's right. This man is, he's, he's, that, that's the guy, you know, like they almost like they vote for Brent, you know, like, Oh man, I love this guy. Like, There's a group called the liberal or I don't know if it's a group, but, uh, the one dude, uh, liberal redneck, uh, he, kind of the same thing. I've never worked with him. Um, but yeah, I think they, there's like three of them and they go on tour together. It's the like, well the red liberal guys, you mean? what's that? The well red guys like Trey Crowder and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With? All, right, all right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Like We're on the same page. Yeah. They're, they're very funny. Um, Brent though, like you said, there's a lot of conservatives that think he's legit, but there's also, a lot of liberals that do too, that are like, I can't believe he's saying this. How dare you? And it's so funny to read the comments. That's almost the best part of his videos. Yeah, all it is. Yeah. He's like, I graduated MAGA yell loudly. It's <laughs> 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 so, so fucking stupid, but fuck, just a perfectly written line, you know? Yeah. But that's a reminder that those are the people that are in your audience. You have to remember yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, sure, but like Trey Crowder and them, I think they're very different, what Trey and them are doing and what Brent's doing. Because Trey, that's just who he is. He is like a very well-spoken dude that grew up in, Char I think, Charlottesville or something like that. Like, he's like, he grew up in the country and as a country boy, but like, without those ideals or whatever, like without like the racist ideals, I don't know. So he's just being himself. Brent is a, is a character. Like that's like Stephen Colbert level character, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but Trey and them too, on that point, when they came through, I've worked with him several times when they came through hilarities last time, they ended up selling out a second night. Like Sam gave them like a Wednesday, I think. And then they ended up selling out and they did like a Tuesday or something. Or I know they didn't do a late show. So they did two different nights. So at that point they're drawing their own crowd. You know, those are their people there on a Tuesday to see them, which gives you so much more freedom to, to push the envelope. You know, you've yeah. already won those people over. I'm the fucking opening guy. Nobody gives a shit about my hard hitting opinions. Right. That's the only way I think I could do hilarities if, if I have a bunch of like minded people come and see me. You know what I mean? Or you know, like like our topic tonight or today. It's I need to adjust things or you know that sort of thing. Why do people struggle so much to learn that lesson that you just gotta? the people can't hate you. If you want to get paid and get booked, then you have to be likable. Like, I don't mm -hmm. understand why that's such a hard lesson for comics to learn. Yeah. And I think so a lot of people, people go ahead. A lot of people think they're going to just be Anthony Jeselnik and go and like work a hilarities. You can't, Trump, you, you can't write like Anthony Jeselnik can. That's why you're not Anthony it, Jeselnik. And, exactly. And Anthony Jeselnik wasn't that character when he was in an open mic scene either. Like, Again, you got it. Once people start paying to see you, you can get, you could do anything you want because those are your fans. You know, like mm -hmm. you've already won them over. They've already spent their money. They're excited to see you and they'll give you a long leash to do whatever you want. When you're an unknown person, you might lose somebody on the third fucking word because they don't like how your voice sounds. You, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you may never even get a sentence across to them that they actually listen to because they don't like the tempo that you speak at mm, or they don't yeah. like your body language. I mean, there are so many things that are just, they're just part of it. So like, I feel like as, is the opener, why would you autumn like swim against the current? Just like roll with it, roast the room, be part of it, be part of the crew and then set your headliner up. Who's probably your friend that you're traveling with and set them up to smash the set. And at the end of the show, everybody's happy, you know, 
Like if you go up there with your pride out and you fucking bomb, you just made your buddy's job so much harder. And also mm-hmm. the guy you're about to ride four hours home with in the morning, you know? Mm-hmm. It's the volleyball of comedy. You know, you've got three comics, you got a bump set and then the, let the headliner spike. Yeah. Um, this was just, we were talking about tight volleyball shorts before you got on. So that, that, that works. Uh, last night, no, you make a good point too, that uh, Shane Gillis is at Hilarities and uh, he did jokes that would bomb at an open mic that crushed last night because like you said, his audience knows what he's bringing to the table. People are there to see him. Did he do a lot of controversial stuff? Oh, or every single, every single uh, bit. Oh, really? I yeah. only heard him more on like some clips of podcasts and things. But he's a, by all measures, a really talented comic, though, yeah. right? Or no? Yeah. yeah, I mean the way. So I mean, obviously, with with the pandemic, like he's rusty on stage, but and so he's like working material out, and you know he was very upfront about that. Um, like he did a whole bit about how his sister it was a heroin addict and, uh, and how they like tricked her into going into intervention. And it was, and there were some lines where it was like, Ooh, but then he reminded everybody, this is my sister. Like, this is, you don't have the right to, to have that reaction kind of thing. Um, right. I mean, he joked about the special Olympics. I'm sure. I mean, you can watch that clip on, on that's on YouTube. Um, he did a bunch of, uh, he did pedophile stuff. He did a uh, Harvey Weinstein bit that was just like, it would have, it would have died. It would have killed a room at a, at a mic. Uh, but because his people are there to see him, it right. worked enough. And then he acknowledged that he needed to work on it and then moved on. Um, do you, how do you, how do you feel that works as far as like an opener? You know, if something doesn't work, how do you bring yourself back and how do you set up the rest of the show for success? I haven't really bombed super hard on the road too many times, but the times I have, I've literally put the mic back in the stand and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I know you guys hated all of that, but I had to be up here for 20 minutes to get this 140 bucks so I can afford to eat. Like, uh, you guys are going to love Jeff. He's fucking great. He's been doing this 10 times longer than me. You know what I mean? Like, if it goes that bad, then why act like it didn't, you know? Uh, just right. fucking own up to it and try and level it. At least get it the room back to level before you run away and cry. You know? Right. Yeah, that, that's a good point. <clears throat> I mean, just reminding people that you're a human up there on stage, like you know that that does a lot to at least get them on the same page right. with each other. Like anybody can relate that. Everybody's had a bad day at work. Yeah, once I, like, unlocked, like, the key to figuring out, like, how to open, like, the first two or three minutes, you know, it was almost all of my road work. They're just two-man shows. It's just me and Jeff Blanchard. I cold open and do a half hour, 40 minutes, and then he'll go up and murder for his hour, hour and a half or whatever, you know? And it was like, I used to, I still will... Not so much now, but I would struggle so much with just the first three words to say. Like, you go up there like, what's up? Or, hey, or, you know what I mean? Like, how do you break the, the ice to a completely talkative room who doesn't even know the show's about to start because there aren't run in clubs? You know, there's no announcements. There's like, the bartender looks at you and is like, hey, it's 8.01, you're up, you know? Um, yeah. I, so I like, I do, I just go up and I don't do a joke. I just start talking and thank everybody for coming and, you know, the fucking typical bullshit. Shout out the bartender right off the top or the servers or a quick joke about the parking lot outside or something, you know, like a one liner or whatever, but you got to get them on your side. If you start out with them already against you, like how will you ever I don't want to spend 30 minutes trying to fucking win you back over, you know? That's that's an uphill battle. It's it, I look at it as like a conversation, you know? I mean, if you can't just go up and just start telling somebody, a, walk up to somebody, just start telling them a joke at the at a bar, you know? Right, this right. is the same kind of thing. Yeah. You know? I Let almost, me interrupt your conversation with, with this thing that I think is funny. You don't know right, me. Right, right. Yeah, I almost look at like a bully type situation. Like, you know... They're like, oh, you got to just go up and punch the bully or whatever. Like, 
I will like try and pick out if there's like somebody that's clearly the most popular one in the crowd or like the guy who was being the loudest right before the show started. If none of those pop out, I'll make fun of the fucking owner. Like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, shout out to Tim, the owner. Is this guy going to pay me? Is he really going to pay me? Do you know Tim is good for this? He owes me 140 bucks right now. Like, you know, like, it, just like something stupid like that is enough to give people a chance to breathe and be like, oh, okay, the comedian's up there now, yeah. you know? Yeah. God, I've, I mean, I've done bar shows where the host of the show just goes up and goes right into their material, and it's like, what are you doing? They're learning, man. Yeah. Hopefully, you know, they're learning. Yeah. That's how I got kicked out of uh, MGM, or I mean the uh, Northfield Park. <laughs> when Chad threw me under the bus being a year and a half into comedy, I just completely ate shit. I did a lot of current, like, uh, current, like, uh, sports jokes, like about Johnny Manziel and, 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 and LeBron leaving, or LeBron coming back, I think. And then after that, it all fell apart. Because I yeah, just went I, into my regular hipster set that the kid, the kids in Lakewood like, but <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. So yeah, and I know we all love as local Clevelanders to shit on the Roxino, but believe me when I tell you this, that's pretty much how casino gigs go. You know, mm -hmm. I mean that that's just how they are. Um, that room's a little harder because of like the way they seat it and it, you know, it's like not seated front to back. It's like seated by how much they paid to see you. So it's not, I simply couldn't, room, but all casino rooms are hard like that. They just, yeah, I, I simply couldn't relate to those people at that stage. I'm still having a hard time relating to certain demographics. So, you know, whatever. All right. Imagine, I mean, my West Virginia room, I got to walk up there and do new material every single month because it's like basically, the you know, 30 of the same people and then mm -hmm. 80 new people, you know, 110, 115 a month or a night, twice a month. And it's like, right, how do I really relate to this entirely Trump town? There's like three MAGA hats in the audience and I'm supposed to somehow not fucking point that out. Yeah. How do you, I mean... How do you connect with with a room like that? That's that is on an idea. Oh, I sell out. Yeah, I sell out a hundred percent. I take no chances. I'm there to get paid. I fucking I will right. throw compliments, whatever it takes to get them on my side. Yeah, I mean, but if you're doing there, you know, it's my room, but I'm only the host. Like, I don't that I'm not there for that glory. I want my headliners that I'm paying good money to kill you know like uh, who gives a shit how well i do you have to sell out there i mean that's the whole point i mean what else are you going to do in that situation like that's literally your best option yeah. if you don't take that i think you're doing a disservice to yourself and them and that i mean that's what that road gig is about that's what the whole road is about i mean unless you have your own fans and you can do what you want there it's like you gotta go and you gotta you gotta entertain them and do. that's not my end game. That's why I'm different. Like where I'm, I'm never, I've never been trying to appeal to those people. And I have realized what my Avenue, my good avenues are, and what my bad avenues are. That's why I want to move to a bigger city. I want to go and do other different things. You know, like when I went to Chicago and laugh factory, they loved me. I didn't have to change at all. It was like, I was so like floored by that. I just thought it was weird. You're doing a job. You have a job to do. You're getting paid to make this group of people in the room laugh, whether you're ideologically opposed to them or not, doesn't matter. You're still human. Right. You still think things are funny. Like you have to make right. that connection. I'm not, you know, I'm, if I'm working at a restaurant, I'm not selling something that isn't on the menu. Right. I would, I would, I would, I would get fired and my table would hate me. Like, why would you talk up this dish? And then when I order it, say, Oh, we don't carry that. I was just telling you, you know, it's, Right, I also right. use the menu analogy. Yeah. <laughs> but except I go the other direction. I'm like, if you don't like caviar, fuck you. Go eat some macaroni and cheese at another restaurant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But uh, so like, I, I do think, I mean, you have to, you just have to. And I got a lot more road work than most of my peers because I was willing and able to do that. But also like, I was maybe too willing to do that and I didn't bomb enough coming up like on those gigs to really learn some of the other shit that you can only learn from bombing. 
And like, I don't, I'm not like throwing him under the bus or anything. I got a lot of respect for him. But like John Bruton went and did some gigs with us here and there. And um, he did stick to his guns. He said coon in a room of only white people at like a youth baseball fundraiser, you know, um, like, and it was like his second sentence. And then he said, I do 20 minutes. But he like he got him back and did well, and he learned something in that twenty minutes maybe that I didn't learn because I didn't take those kinds of chances. And like Jimmy Graham's like another example of somebody who like Jimmy he goes through phases where he's like real weird and will bomb a bunch, but then he goes through phases where everything clicks and he just murders. And I feel like without the lows, his highs wouldn't be as high. Yeah. Like, if that makes sense. I agree. No. Like, those are two guys in the local scene that you know who they are from the time they start talking. They don't really have to explain it. Where maybe I will have to explain. I'm not really a racist hillbilly. This is just how I appear, you know. Like, you know those guys. You could tell who they are and what they're about. And they do very, very good at that. And I think that that comes from their five – plus years of being consistently who they are, you know, maybe not melting as much as I did to conform to things. You know, I mean, we got to remember there really isn't a right way to do this. There's a lot of wrong ways, but there's no one right way. Right. Yeah. You got to stay true. uh, to what. yeah. I mean, even, even if you are like pandering to a crowd, you still have to be truthful. I mean, you still have to, you know, you still have to find a way to authentically connect with them. So is it really selling out? I don't know. It takes steps to get there. So you got to do them. You got to take those steps. You got to be the opening guy, you know? Yeah. That's where you make all your contacts. For sure. And, and I mean, I feel like being an opener is, it's a totally different job from the other comics, uh, or especially if you're just like hosting, if you're a host, like that's, you that's getting used to setting up a room and and setting the tone for the show you're a functioning piece of the show mm-hmm. you know that's what you are you you have purpose and things you have to do you have responsibilities you have to do and i bet if you ask 10 managers of clubs what's my most important job as a host i bet very few would say get laughs like be funny yeah i mean maybe some would but i bet most of them will be like push the fucking chicken fingers don't mess up people's name you know what i mean like don't do anything that's gonna upset the crowd before the feature gets up there they may tell you stay clean you know i mean they're gonna tell you a lot of things if you ask them that what's the most important thing i could do as a host but i bet very few will say be funny you know yeah that's not your job that's the headliner's job and the feature sets them up. The middle sets them up. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, I, you still gotta be funny. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But like, you know, there, you are a functioning piece of the show. You have duties to perform. Right. I learned that my first hosting weekend at the funny stop was for Michael tricks. <laughs> so, oh boy. Yeah. So and I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. Well, was, the dis- was the disgruntled clown busy or what? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I, I was a host. So I was like, all right, I'm going to bring my best stuff up. Pete was like, ask if they have birthdays, you know, do, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. But most importantly me. And then I learned the hard way that they weren't there to see me. Right. So if I were to have to host for Michael tricks again, I would know what to do next time. You know, it was, like, no. yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, so you're right. Like, it's the learning experience. I, I wouldn't have learned to host better without that experience. Um, you've got a bomb. You've got to lean into the bomb. And that, and you've got to work with different crowds, um, you know, from urban crowds to liberal crowds to, like, super liberal crowds to conservative crowds to rural crowds. you got to know. How does your your set, I mean, I guess you've already kind of answered this, but will you call an audible in the middle of a set if you realize that that joke didn't work, my next three jokes aren't going to work. I got to plug something else in. Like, Oh yeah. Sure. You, how would you do that? Like, how do you, how does that work best for you? Like, um, I guess like I have 
Well, depending on the gig. I mean, like I pretty much do two distinct things, either club work or like long sets on the road and long sets on the road. Pretty much. I have like, I try and spend at least five minutes before I do any material material, just like acknowledging the room and things in it, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I'll do something that's topical. That is working really well at the time. Nothing too risky that I know will get a laugh. And then since I don't really do open mics much anymore, Minutes like 12 through 16 or 18 on the road for me are my open mic minutes. I'll riff if I have an idea or something like that. Um, And then by like minute 20 at that point, I got about 10 minutes left and I should start building momentum for Jeff and setting things up for him correctly and making sure everything in the room is right. And if, I need to call something out from the stage like music or a door that keeps opening or something like at minute 20. Then I start focusing on that kind of stuff. And my closers are things that I've been doing for years that I I can do drunk sober standing on my head. It doesn't matter. Like I said, so at that point I start focusing on the other parts of the room before I close it out for him, you know? Mm. But yeah, definitely my closers, I can do squeaky TV clean or filthy, dirty barroom style, the same two jokes. And that's just pretty much what I always close on on the road. And they like one leads perfectly right into the other one. They take 10 minutes either way, you know. So I wouldn't say that I will audible as much by like doing completely different stuff, but I will absolutely change the words or what I'm doing. Yeah, it sounds like you have like a structure, but also uh, an adaptability. Like you read the energy of the room and you go with that. Right. I I think you got to do it that way. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, I'm not brave enough to just wing it and I'm not talented enough to just wing it. So I have to have like some kind of structure to, or I'll just be rambling, you know? Yeah. I mean, the energy of the room is, is, the most important thing. Like if you're losing them, you have to either draw attention to it or, you know, match your energy to their energy. I don't know. How would you, uh, how would you recommend adapting to something like that? Only call attention to how bad you're doing though. I really hate when people go up and shit on the audience because you're comedian seven and nobody else has done well yet. Like fucking that's still on you. Like either, don't go up or try your best. Like I really, really hate when people will just be like, Oh, you guys haven't liked anything all night or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's complete bullshit by the way, because you can totally, you have a better opportunity of doing good. If everybody did bad before you, you have the opportunity of setting yourself apart from everyone else. They're looking for a hero. Yeah. They really are dying for that. So you have the, opportunity to give them that and they will love you more than they would if the person before you did pretty good not amazing like where they buried you but yeah. like you know i've done it a million times like where i'm like this is a great opportunity and it worked you know so right but that's because what you just said because you walked up there with this mindset this is a great opportunity which is a whole different mindset than like oh this is probably gonna suck like the last six people did you know yeah it's just not true. It's an illusion or it's a, it's a myth. Right. <laughs> right. I just, I really hate that. So yes, if you're doing bad or if you step out of line or do something dumb, then you can absolutely call attention to that. But yeah. certainly I, I hate when people attack the audience because then you are making it much harder for everybody else. Now you've turned it into two competing sides, the comics and the crowd, which sucks. Yeah. The key is definitely setting the tone, though. You got to go up there and, and make them like go, oh, this guy's going to be different, or at least this guy could definitely right. be different by his, I can tell by his attitude right out the, right the gate. Right. So. You guys brought up Jezelnik earlier, and I was at the comedy store the first time I'd ever been there. And I was in like the, their main room, and it's 10 minute spots, and it's kind of just like their favorites. And I mean, I watched like, Elijah Schlesinger, Bobby Lee, Chris D'Elia, like the best of the best currently, even now, they're all still top of their game. 
and they all were bombing. Elijah Schlesinger did like a little dance at the end of hers and was like, fuck you, that dance got me a Netflix special and walked off. Like that's like how bad the crowd was. And Jeselnik walked up there with his note, like a notebook and put it down on the stool and was like, you fucking people don't deserve polished material. And he just started going through his notebook and like one lining out of it and Mm -hmm. murdered with it. And like, he never acknowledged that he was doing well. Like he was like, yeah, of course that's fucking good. Like I'm fucking good. You guys suck. You know, it's like, just kept <laughs> walking through him. and like he murdered for his entire 10 minutes and brought the room back. Like, and then that Brody Stevens went up next. And that was the only experience I'd ever had with that dude, Brody Stevens. And what a beautiful fucking maniac that guy was. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me a lot of like, God, I, f- I feel like this would be up on the on the Rushmore of of comedy moments. Would be uh, Bill Burr's Crushmore, two thousand six. Yeah, Mount Crushmore. <laughs> well, he's so quick with those quips, man. Um, the uh, his two thousand six set. It was the Opie and Anthony. Um, yeah, Ryan loves to play that when he's drunk. Ryan DePerna. There are exceptions to every rule. Uh, in in comedy and shitting on the audience yeah yeah i I mean bill burr is a is an absolute animal uh i mean even this was 2006 so you know he's not the level that he is now i remember uh when he was still headlining clubs like around the country now he's selling out arenas and shit well people still knew who he was at that time in 2006 if like I guess like a similar thing would be like at Rover Fest, right? If <laughs> if a fucking comic that nobody knew went up at Rover Fest and did that, you get you be fucking beat to death before you got out of the crowd, you know? Mm-hmm. People still knew Bill Burr at that time, so that's why he got away with it, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, and and he did it in a way that was so over the top and well performed that even if you hated them, you would still be amused by their performance, you know? But yeah, that's like a classic moment. Just the sheer attitude and the confidence. The confidence was everything. Right. Like, oh. you know, most of it, like a lot of it. <laughs> the whole time. I, well, and also it's a Philly crowd. So, you know, and, and the comics before him, like legends didn't do great. Like Tracy Morgan walked off seven minutes into a set because they were. Damarera. Yeah, they booed Dom Herrera. <laughs> so he just gets up and rips them. But my, my favorite part is he just, I mean, in between ripping them, he's like counting down the time he has on stage. Like <laughs> That's what I was just going to say. That's my favorite part of the whole thing. He's like, six minutes. <laughs> he just keeps going. They're booing the whole time, but they're laughing the whole time yeah. too. Because he needed to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. If he would have gone up and did his his set, it would have just it wouldn't it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> right. Doing that to- also, there are exceptions to every rule, but that's lightning in a bottle. Mm-hmm. That shit. You yeah. like go go try it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that's something that it just it happened and it was perfect when it happened, and he was the right guy in the right moment with the right buzz or the right mindset to go make that work, you know, even he couldn't pull that off again in that fashion. I mean, that was lightning in a bottle, one off, never happened again. We're all lucky that it was a, an event that was recorded, you know? Yeah. Laughing. Got to do 45 minutes at the funny stop, 30 on the road, like 20 at hilarities and six at the improv. Like, <laughs> right. Have you guys worked there the improv? I haven't. No. Oh man, you gotta earn your stripes there. You either, but that's like, um, it's good. Like you either, I think you either crush there or you eat a dick. Like there's no in between. Like at hilarities, you could do okay, and the crowd will give you an okay response, like the video of my clip you showed, right? Mm-hmm. But like at the improv, if you just do okay, you're getting fucking hacked. How do you uh, respond? I don't go there anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just don't. Uh, I haven't worked there too much, really. I've done about four or five shows there, like actual like paid shows, and they were fun. But yeah, it's tough. 
tough to do. How do you, how would you recommend working a room like that? You know, what do you, what's like one tool or one strategy? I think for me, I would, at this point, I would just have to stick to the material. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that I would relate or understand the audience enough to start riffing my own opinions into something untested subjects or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that would be a terrible mistake, at least for me. But um, almost 10 years in, I have material that works in every room. So I would absolutely just have to stick to the words I've previously <laughs> written. Um, that I Like, that's what I would do. I don't know how I would overcome that. And I really wouldn't try and do more than like 10 or 15 minutes there. I think any more than that, I would be left with like having to riff things, you know? Mm -hmm. I tried that joke about pretending to be Canadian at hockey games there one time. And um, it went about as well as you could expect. Like um, some guy, like about three minutes in, stood up, was like, I'm funnier than you. <laughs> it was amateur night, and I'm the MC, so there's 10 more amateurs after me. Oh, man. Oh, awesome. It was like, he's like heckling me. I'm like, oh, thanks for weighing in, guy nobody gives a shit about. And like, mm -hmm. I got a little bit of a laugh. But then he just kept yelling at me until he got thrown out. Like, oh, awesome. Um, hour okay. and 14 more minutes of amateur comedy coming up, everybody, you know. Now that we're all having fun, except for that guy. Right, right. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you, I mean, there's different levels of hecklers, but I think it's interesting because there are different ways to handle each heckler uh, as, as they come. Uh, you know, just as a general overarching rule before we kind of dive into to each type of heckler, like what what is the first thing that comes to your mind um, as a rule of thumb, if you are heckled, just overall? Me? I, th I mean, it's simple for me. And somebody explained this to me, fuck, like year one or two. I wish I could give them credit to who it was. Maybe it was like Charlie Wiener or one of those guys, one of the old road dogs. But he was like, um, it was Charlie Wiener. And he goes, um, I love how you react to everything going on in the crowd. It's like a curse I have here and seeing things out. And he's like, I love how you react to everything in the crowd. He goes, well, you don't have to do that. You don't have to react to things that happen. It's your show. He said, uh, if it's not going to add to the show, then don't do it. And that's like something I found myself you thinking those exact words on the stage in the moment. Like, okay, this dude just broke a beer bottle, but he's already been interrupting the show for the last 15 minutes. Is, is fucking with him going to add to the show? Or is it going to contribute to that guy's wildness to continue? You know what I mean? And like, like um, I think some people, that answer will be different for different comics and how you would handle the situation. But like, you know, sometimes in that moment, you could get the easy laugh and fuck with that guy for sure. But maybe you don't. Like, you just keep getting through your set so that maybe the headliner can have a fair room where you haven't verbally assaulted them for misbehaving or whatever, you know? But that's the rule. Is it going to add to the show or distract from it? When you're doing an open mic, it's fun to see what you can do. But when it's a real show, it's like a whole other thing. You just, the best thing to do is ignore them as much as you can. And if you're equipped to, to, to handle it and make the show better, like you said, you know, then do that. But it's not, you're right. right. It's not open mic comedy and pay comedy are like two different sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shooting around and big game. Right. Nobody, nobody has to let you do an open mic. You just go sign up. You know what I mean? Like to do paid shows, you have to be selected. Like somebody chose you and somebody's ass is on the line. Even if it's not yours, it's the booker. Right. Or the venue, promoter, the owner of the business, like there are mm -hmm. things to you know. People pay to see me. I behave differently. Like I, there's certain things that I just won't do unless it's absolutely necessary and it's a little bit more relaxed. But if it's, especially if the people I don't know in the venue, I don't know, then it's like you got to just stick to to what you you're doing because it's just not right. good business. So that guy at the improv is the only time I've ever been heckled like that. Like the, you're not funny heckle, you know, like a, a, a true, like attack heckle. What's mm -hmm. the worst heckle? You, that was my worst. And 
awfully i have my camera on the table behind that guy so i have a video with him <laughs> and her and everything and he the dude could have clearly kicked my ass too he's like a big, big dude too so what was yours what was your worst heckle uh I've got a couple that come to mind. Um, there's one. I was pretty. I was still pretty new. I was. It was like a contest or something at the funny stop, and I was like 12 comics in, and the comic before me did a joke about fucking his grandma, fucking a four year old, and fucking a dolphin, and lost the entire audience. And it was a. Uh, it was a. Yeah. It was not. It was not good. And uh, and like Pete got on and yelled at him during a set and all that. And at that point, I didn't really know how to reset the room because the host, whoever was emceeing, didn't do that either. Um, so I'm up on stage and the audience is just talking amongst themselves. Like, <laughs> I feel like I'm in the cafeteria. And, uh, and I did my breach baby joke and this one woman yells out, uh, oh, that's why you're so big headed. Yeah. And like, you know, she got the biggest <laughs> laugh of my set. <laughs> she got the biggest laugh of my set. And I didn't, I didn't have anything for her. Like, and well, it was, at least you got a tag. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. And, That's funny. Uh, and, and now, like, now I, I would have, you know, I would add to it because my whole thing, I have an improv background. So my, my, um, my instinct is to, like, act like that was part of the show. So, like, I try to add to it. And I don't, I don't address everything now. Like you said, if it's not going to add right. to what I'm doing, I'm not going to, like, I was at Funny Stop a couple weeks ago. And uh, doing a bit about, you know, how my last name's Horning and like, uh, you know, I use that as you know, people used to bully me because horny, you know, and if you lean into that, people won't bully you anymore. Like if you lean into the bully, it's right. right. And uh, so I do a bit where I'm like, well, I want to see how far I can take it. Like if a guy holds me up at gunpoint and it's like, give me your phone and your wallet. I want to look him in the eye and say, I love how you talk dirty to me. And that's how I'll get out of a robbery and into a relationship. And then, uh, and then right when I said that line, I got a laugh and there was a little pause and then someone's phone went off and it was like violin, like orchestral music on the, on the ringtone. And I was like, yeah, and that music will be playing in the background. It'll be like super romantic. And then the audience like loved it. Uh, and it's just like lean, I lean into it now. Um, if somebody, you know, says something and it'll either work or it won't, but you know, it's confidence, man. Now yeah. you have the confidence because you have the tools to handle it. Yeah, it's not. I'm not going to let it derail my set because uh, I mean, every set is just a stepping stone to getting better. So you know, I have no. Right. There's no stakes. I'm still getting paid. Right. I tell you to fuck yourself and tell the audience that they're all you know a bunch of whatever. That's right. Leaning into it is counterintuitive. That's a great idea because they don't see it coming. And if you can be sarcastic, I mean, it depends on your comic approach because some people just can't switch to sarcasm and make it make sense. But if you can, that's, that can be really funny. Yeah. I don't, I don't see any value in resisting it because it's happened. It's there. Like that woman said, you know, that's why you're so big headed. And I like, I didn't know what to do. So I just kept going. And that, yeah. I think that caught me like, cause at that moment, the rest of the room got quiet and they were like, what's he going to say? And I was like, next joke. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of hecklers over the years. It's been like eight years now. And it's like, I've dealt with so many because I, a lot of times I ask for it too, in a sense. So I couldn't think of the actual worst heckler, but the most recent and probably one of the worst was when I was at funny stop and <laughs> common theme rich Voss, I think was there. Yeah. It was rich Voss. There was a uh, Jim Florentine and uh, I was co-featuring or something or I forget. But uh, he, uh, anyways, so very small crowd, uh, go up, and in the middle of my set, this lady in the back just sloshed. Her and her husband were sloshed. She was like, you're failing. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have right. shit. I didn't have shit. I think I told her she was failing as an audience member, because she was, but it, it might have gotten a laugh. I don't remember, but it, it wasn't great. <laughs> that's funny yeah you're so. failing yeah i mean i love i don't know I, I enjoy watching those videos but of like you know uh steve hofstetter and like um andrew schultz is is good with hecklers too um, though, i mean those are fun to watch you can learn you can definitely learn something from that 
Uh, one technique that I've seen that works it is a lot of time the audience, like people in the back, won't hear what the person up front. Right, up, yeah. yeah, like 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 crowd work. I remember I was researching crowd work recently. I was doing a lot of research on because I wanted to get better at it, and they were saying. A lot of common theme was, hey, repeat what the person in the front said to the rest of the audience. That way they can get the context because right. they can't hear them. They don't have a microphone. You can change it to anything you want and they can't do shit about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. 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 That's so true. You're right. I, dude, yeah. I've done that so many times where I'm like, what did you say? You're leaving this gentleman next to you? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, totally oh, yeah, dude. Man. In, in Shady Side, West Virginia, I think I started a domestic dispute doing something <laughs> <laughs> like something to me and I was like I know I'm irresistible in this t-shirt I know or in this button up you know and the dude started to get all mad at her I'm like you heard what she said the first time like but I never even heard what she said I was just like fucking with her that's know? brilliant <laughs> yeah, you know, I have like that that curse that I hear I can in bar gigs I'll be able to tell what the person at the bar is ordering in the back of the room in the middle of my joke like I wish it wasn't that way, but I see and hear so many little details that I have to just wash them out or I could spend the whole time just talking about them. If you, if you want to crush as a comic, like one great thing in terms of crowd work and dealing with an audience or in just general, it, one good approach is you have that character about you where you are not phased and you are just in a constant comedic attitude yeah. and then... And you're also, and then you're also equipped with just the wit there, or if if you need it, or just have stuff that you have pre written sort of thing. Yeah. And like what you were saying, where you just sort of like make shit up, and then people will laugh at just how absurd you are. Right, dude. Chad Zumach, say what you will about Chad, and we've all said what we will about Chad many times. Mm -hmm. But Chad Dumak has bulletproof confidence, and it serves him very well on stage. Absolutely. He has one, he has one of the biggest triumphs I've ever seen in comedy live in person was goddamn Chad Zumak at um, Rock on the Range. The venue gets evacuated for lightning, so everybody has to leave um, except the performers. I got Squire's random extra pass. So I'm back. We're like all the artists went backstage. That's when I met Trey Crowder. We're all standing there drinking beers. All the comics, Tom Dustin, hanging out, and everybody just alienated Chad, and he stood off by himself, off to the side for like four hours while we had the ultimate boys club talk beer drinking session, and Chad just was alienated and blah blah blah. And they were going to bump Chad all together off the show. And he handled that pretty well. And then last minute, Dave Stroop came up was like, Chad, will you host this show for J.D. Smooth? You know, will you just be the host? And I think Chad might have been originally scheduled to close that. Um, and he went out in front of a crowd that the show was an hour late. There was a death metal band playing in the tent next to that tent. So you couldn't hear anything. There was literally not one single person sitting down when Chad started, not one person because the show wasn't supposed to start then. He did like 10 to 15 minutes of material with that where he's like holding the mic, bobbing around like this shit that he does. And yeah. he's strutting around, acting like a fucking asshole. But yeah. by the end of his 10 or 12 minute set, every seat in the entire tent was full. Everybody was settled. Everybody was listening to comedy. And he was getting great laughs on all of his punchlines. And like by the time he bought JB Smooth up, the room was perfect. The tent was perfect. And he literally built it from nothing. And it was yeah, that's great. It was like it was all only confidence got him all of that. Yeah. yeah. That's a lesson for sure. Do you have, huge. Yeah, oh, 100%. Uh, they, they, they smell blood in the water if they, you know, if they get a heckle through and you, you're like jarred by it. Like, right, right. So then it's the open rain, it's open season. Like, right. you're. So what's our, eight, what's our eight types of heckler? Eight types of hecklers. All right. The first, the instigator, the people who are there to start trouble. So they pick on comedians. AKA unsuspecting 
bar patron who didn't know there was comedy. <laughs> yeah, what makes this different from a regular heckler in the instigative sense? I guess, uh, keep going. The second is the non-participant. So this is the audience, the people that are going out of their way to just like continue having the conversation with the person next to them or they're on their phone up front. I mean, that's, all, that's in itself a heckle. How, oh, yeah. how, uh, how do you respond to that? Because I mean, especially if they're up front, like you have, because the rest of the audience sees it. So like, how, do, how is that dealt with? I mean, how do you, what's your particular way? Or is there an example of seeing somebody else do it? If I'm at a club, then I'm not a headliner at a club. So I feel like it's my responsibility to point that out, especially as the host. Mm-hmm. If you're a host and you let them talk through your whole 10 minutes set and then you bring up the feature, you failed as a host for not stopping that and making mm-hmm. sure the route was right. So like in that, as a host, you have a responsibility to handle that. As a feature, you have a choice. Do you want to fuck with them and possibly derail your set? Or do you want to plow through it? Or do you want to plow through it? And as you walk back to the green room, tell the headliner how comfy they've been and save it for the headliner to really fucking murder them. Last year, St. Patrick's Day, all the comics before me were, well, a lot of them were doing sketch and they had to like, they didn't, they couldn't even rehearse any of this stuff. So they did it all. It was it wasn't really working out because there was a, a couple audience members in the very front row just talking and they were talking to each other, but they were also being like, "This show sucks!" like really loud, and like everybody before me had just plowed through their set, especially if they were doing sketch because they can't break character. And so finally, I went up and I had to I had to take it and I had them thrown out by the cops and I actually got the crowd back and then the rest of the show went really well and the um, like Polk. Uh, like last call Cleveland did really well after that because like, you know, I was the first person to address that halfway through the show. Like I finally was like, Hey, get the fuck out of here. And like, you know, it, it worked out pretty well, but it wasn't anything witty either. Like there were a couple things where I got the audience to laugh at them, but it wasn't spectacular. And then Sam like apologized to me because Sam's a professional, even though he didn't need to do that. Um, so that was, that was a good example of that. Well, stop doing comedy on St. Patrick's Day in fucking Cleveland. Right. Well, I mean, you know, it was hilarities. I mean, right. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Take the gigs as they come. That's, right. that's one of those things, especially if none of the other comics mention it, or if like you, like you said, it was sketch. Like the rest of the audience has noticed, you know, they're there to see the show. And then there's, there's these drunks that are, that won't shut the fuck up. Sometimes those simplest shut the fuck up. Like, Gets the rest of the audience on your side. Uh, at Bonkers, yeah. if you um, uh, did you ever go up in that room, David? At all? I know Murs did a lot of gigs for me there before. Where it, at? It's like the Hermit Club in the Hofbra House. No, it's that like was a- that was just before I got started in Cleveland. Yeah, so it's like a hundred and some year old theater that's built so you don't need microphones. And I did a handful of shows there with no sound system. With a hundred people in the crowd and it's built so that you can do that. And uh, so any audience member talking there is also just as loud, like they have a microphone. And I used to turn the crowd against each other and be like, (laughs) who's having a good time when people would clap? And I'd be like, well, these people are. Everybody boo these fucking people so that they shut up. And I get the (laughs) whole crowd to boom. And then if they start talking again. I would just stop mid sentence and be like, "Boo these people again!" Like you yeah. them out of the room. But that the winter was- shows, the winter shows were amazing. The summer shows were atrocious, right? Yep. <laughs> From what I remember. And I tried to not. I tried to help them with those things. Like, hey, why don't you not schedule comedy during any sports playoffs? Because nobody in Cleveland is going to come here. We did a show during the NBA Finals, and they were like you have to be there to get paid. And like, if I wasn't there, then I would lose the gig. So like, I just had to go there and prove to them. Nobody showed up to either show to get paid for the night. Hmm. Like, why would it, it's like game five. The finals are a mile up the road. We've never won. I haven't won a championship in 60 years. Nobody gives a shit about free bonkers comedy. No, right. no, that's a, that's on, that's on the booker. Uh, like, fuck it. Yeah. They left me in charge to help them and tell them these things, and then they just ignored all those things. 
Yeah. And then Hofbrau hated us so much that one night I just showed up and Hofbrau, the servers were like, man, we're so glad this is the last time we're ever doing comedy here. But I still had a contract for like eight more months there, you know, through Bonkers. So I called the owner of Bonkers and they handled shit and blah, blah, blah. But Hofbrau literally paid me for every single Friday. I got a direct deposit from them for eight months to host shows there. That never happened. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> He would rather pay you to not be there. It was like 150 bucks every Friday I would get to just not do comedy there anymore. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah. And it lasted, I think, I want to say about by the time all the legal shit happened, I want to say I got paid for Man, five months. That, is, for that is passive income. Yeah. That's- it, <laughs> fucks me on my, it fucks me on my taxes, though, because 150 bucks a week adds up if you don't pay taxes on it. And at the end of the year, I was like, how do I owe a thousand dollars from comedy money? Like, did I make a thousand dollars from comedy this year? Right. And I was looking, and I'm like, oh yeah, all those direct deposits, I guess I should have been saving a third of every one of those, you know. Right. Yeah. But they booked me a lot after that. I mean, they still Bonker still will reach out and offer me gigs and they're casino gigs, but you always get to work with interesting people, like mm-hmm. comics and stuff, you know. And I met some really cool comics there. Right. Some of them are hacky. Their headliners are old hacky road dogs, but that's what sells tickets in the markets that they service. So Mm -hmm. like, it's not so much that the business sucks is that the markets that they service don't have good taste, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, whether, whether you're hacky or not, if you can get a room of people to laugh and you've made a career doing that, I can't, I can't disrespect. No disrespect. Absolutely. We can harp on dick jokes and fart jokes all we want, but if it gets a room laughing, whatever. Um, I had a, I had a playoff situation. I was keynoting a conference in uh, Minneapolis on the day of the NFC championship game during the NFC championship game. That was the game where they won on the the last second um, against the saints and uh, I went up like at halftime and the, and the Vikings were winning 17, nothing. And I drew attention to that. And I was like, Oh, you guys can pay attention to me now. Cause this is, you know, the game's over. And then I noticed people just getting on their phones. And at that point I didn't have the tools to like roll with it. Um, so I, I literally got on my phone and saw it was tied. And I was like, I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> like you're, you're not going to pay attention to a word that I'm saying. So yeah. Oh, no, championship is divisional. People sport. telling horror stories for the last half hour. Oh, it's happened. Oh, man. Yeah, it does I mean, happen. It the Rocks, you know, one time when the Indians were in the playoffs, and I think it was like, it was me. It was just supposed to be Ramon headlining, Mary featuring, and neither one of them wanted to do the full time to fill an hour and a half. But the venue wouldn't pay for a host, so Mary and Ramon each gave me money each show to come host for them, right? And then Friday went great. Ramon sold out the late show and that room holds like 400. It was super fun. Mary did good. And then I think the Saturday shows, there was an Indians game in the early show we did right through the game. Right. And in between shows, they start broadcasting the game on the projection screen behind on the stage, you know, and Mm -hmm. like it goes into extra innings and Ramon goes out and he's like telling the venue, like, hey, let the game play. Don't fucking end this in the 10th inning or whatever. Well, the mm-hmm. shit went to like 15 innings. And finally, the venue's like, no, we have to do the show. So, right in the middle of the pen ultimate moment of this like eight hour baseball game, the screen just goes up and the lights come uh-huh. on and the guys start the intro. <laughs> And I got to go out there and I just asked the crowd, I was like, would you guys rather I did 10 minutes of comedy or just played the game on my phone and describe what happened? <laughs> That's, That's like what I did. Opening. I just like played the game on my phone, but not the video, just like the updates on ESPN app. And I just kept reading the updates out loud, like all three just outside, you know, <laughs> it was miserable. And then Mary went up and did regular comedy and shit against all odds but oh that was fucking awful that was a great idea though yeah on your part <laughs> it's Ugh. not often you you start your set with the entire audience hating you <laughs> oh dude Ugh. yeah one time i did a gig in pittsburgh and 
and they introduced me as from Cleveland and a big Browns fan, and neither one of those are really true. And I just got this relentless, like, five minutes of booing. Like, it was, like, half my set time was just getting booed. And I'm like, we had an 0-16 parade. Do you think your words could fucking hurt me, you know? And I got to laugh, and then I was able to do comedy after that. But You crossed the line. The third is the corrector. The person who thinks they're doing the comedian a favor by interrupting the act to bring up some kind of ambiguity or inaccuracy. How do you rock with that? Have you ever had that or seen it? Oh, uh, no, only in fun ways. I don't really get a lot of negative heckles. I do that joke where I say, um, geez, geez, I like is the plural, plural of Jesus. You know, I say, geez, I, and this lady in West Virginia laughed. And then when my was closing, I say peni is the plural of penis. And she's like, oh my God, that's not true. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, she was like, so I'm like, honey, I know you're like a third grade English teacher. Calm down, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But never in a negative way. I've never had somebody like stop me to correct me, you know. Uh, it's like you, sat through, you sat through the first one. And right, then, right. This is where you draw the line. Well, she was whispering after the first one, which I saw. So when she freaked out about the second one, I like had fun with her for a bit. But at that point, again, it was adding to the show. If I would have stopped at the beginning, it would have been taken away from me. Okay, so the next, the uptight fan. Um, They seem to think that right in the middle of the act is the perfectly appropriate time to present their grievances to the comedian. Mm -hmm. They've been offended by something you've said. Have you uh, have you had to deal with that? No, no. Have you seen any? Some woman threw a drink at Jimmy one time at the Winchester because he said "broad." <laughs> it was pretty funny. He said that he was like, "That's where the line was broad." Yeah, he said like some old broad as a line in a in a bit. It wasn't a punchline or anything. It was just a line that he said, and then this old broad blah blah blah. And so he just walks up and missed him by a mile, but threw a drink and was like, "I'm an old broad." You could say she couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Mm. Stop it. <laughs> Edit that, Jeremy. Yeah. That, <laughs> have you guys ever had that? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, all right, so I did a I did a bit. It was um it was like a character bit where I uh, uh advertised the funeral home that I'm starting where the whole thing is like putting the fun in funeral. And uh, I had a guy in the front row doing this the whole time, um, but equally, I've I've had a dude do uh, after I did that exact same bit come up to me afterwards and was like, hey, "My wife just died, and like I needed that laugh." So you know, you, we do weird things at funerals, and that was really funny, and I never thought of it that way. So thank you. So it was like one of those where it's yeah, like, that's cool. That one means a lot more, but I'll always remember this happening right in front yeah. of me while everyone else is like not laughing that hard because the guy in front of them is doing this the whole time and I didn't draw attention to it. So, yeah. Um, I am I, I see Chad Zumach's album recording a few years ago at the funny stop, one of them that he did there. And this lady, um, I don't know if you've produced many albums, but I've produced three or four at this point and it's a lot of money and effort and you got to pay for a sound guy. And there's like a lot of things that go into it. At least a thousand dollars, two string budget to make that night happen. So you have a lot of riding on it, the performance, mm-hmm. right? And this lady during Zumach, she never said a word, but like anytime he would be getting ready to say a punchline or something, she would just raise her hand. Like she was like waiting to be called on. And again, she, she he even was like, what the fuck are you doing, lady? And she just acted like everything was normal. And he'd go back into a bit. She just raised her hand. <laughs> it was one of the weirdest sequels I've ever ever seen but how do you when you're doing an hour how do you in, in minute 28 not be like what the fuck is going on here you know closest thing to that is i've had a uh, collective gasp and then that's it <laughs> clutching of pearls the collective yeah. pearl clutch uh the drunk somebody who's just belligerent i, I think love drunk people they don't bother me one bit the yeah. more the barrier those are the people where I feel like it's beneficial to repeat what they say word for word. Cause chances are that in itself is a punchline. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like a good drunk crowd. I like a good rowdy late crowd. Um, none of those things after hosting LBT for four and a half years, 
There's no drunken shenanigan that's going to catch me off guard. Go right. for it. Have fun. Four more minutes of material I don't have to use. Right. No, this is a gift. Thank you. Thank you right. for being here. Mm-hmm. There was a dude that at LVT who had like face tattoos a few weeks ago and he just walked in, like barged in and like refused to wear a mask and was no, no, and everyone was like, we're not going to tell him to wear a mask. But he was, and he was pretty jacked too. And uh, I went, he doesn't up, want to put anything weird on his face, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, I was like, dude, I wish I had that. Fuck you. I'm not wearing a mask confidence. Dude, I was hosting the yeah. show there one time at yeah. LVT and I'm standing there talking and hosting in the front. This one on the stage was in the back of the room and right in the middle of talk in the front row, there's just water starts pouring out of the ceiling onto them and the table. <laughs> and they're like, they're like playfully reacting like there's somebody in the crowd spraying them with something. But it only took me about two seconds to realize that the toilet in the apartment above there was overflowing through the ceiling. Uh, and they're just like playfully splashing in this water that's absolutely second story toilet water. Uh, it's like, but I just stood there and just did material and kept everybody laughing. And like, in that moment, I'm like, there's nothing that will ever catch me off guard again. Ever. Yeah. That's perfect. It's like, what is your second story apartment toilet water? Everybody has that moment. Right. right. <laughs> uh, and then the last one is the audience plant, which is the, uh, the, the heckler that the comedian puts there because it was part of the act. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Maybe in a televised, a televised thing. I've seen it, but yeah, outside right. real comedy, nobody does that. It feels like an Andy Kaufman kind of. Right. You know how hard it was to convince a headliner to take me with them once I had a half hour of material? And they're going to they're gonna take some guy with one clever sentence and get him a hotel room and put him in the car for four hours and shit. So like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, hey, I got this gig in the, the UP tonight in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's 12 hours away and I really need Jimmy to yell one dumb thing <laughs> to really pull this whole fucking act together. Like, <laughs> that's not real. Nobody does that. Like, TV, like I said, for TV, maybe. But yeah, like Steve was saying, but come hey, on now. I met a guy who I think he called himself a starter or something where hilarities did pay him or at least other clubs paid him to come out and laugh ass at a show and get a show going i don't know if he was right but he was definitely telling me all these stories about how he's a retired engineer and how leno would fly him out just to laugh at his show so that they get the audience going so either he was just a complete pathological liar or he really was like this guy that because he was laughing at everything at the show and then he explained it to me afterwards i mean if he's got There's the money no and laughs is it hilarious i mean he fly him across the country to see comedy it was at CCO. Yeah, he was genuinely laugh. He's just a guy that laughs at like everything. So maybe not so much audience plants, but like regular audience members that it's like, oh, this person's here and they are, they, you know, they contribute to the show. If you need oh, a plan, go do sketch. You get that a lot on the road. Like I call them helplers, you know? Yeah. And they're like, they're people people that think they're helping the show and they're like, oh man, I really saved you up there when I shouted that thing in minute seven out of 40, you know what I mean? Like, uh, mm-hmm. but you get a lot of that. Say you, you know, that bar only has comedy eight weeks out of the year to eight summer weeks, June and July. And that guy will buy a ticket to all eight shows right up front at the beginning of the year. He comes in and out shit out like that is a real person you know they do exist mm-hmm. yeah i tried i tried an open mic yeah. but i'm better interrupting your stuff. Yeah, yeah 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 we did uh for we uh steve and i were talking about this before you jumped on when we were doing the rooftop show we did uh we did like we had theme shows and we did like like an opening sketch and in hindsight in hindsight you know it wasn't the place for it um, but I, I I don't regret one bit of it. It and, was fun, and you did a really good job for what it's worth. Oh, thanks, man. I did want to watch too, and you they were they were really well done. Thanks, man. And the the days that they were the best were the days where there weren't any Indians games. 
And this particular day, there were two Indians games that were both over by the time the show started. Like the last one got out maybe an hour before the show started. So there's a bunch of people that just went to two Indians games and were wasted on the roof. Mm -hmm. And the theme for this show was we were going to pitch the audience on joining a a pyramid scheme. And uh, it did not work. (laughs) Yeah. We walked everybody. (laughs) <laughs> everybody like there was no new you know they, they had no time for it they were like this is weird we're leaving it was definitely there was even a, a it Google was one of our most poorly rehearsed though too yeah, well, on top of the fact that it was a very complicated plot yeah or, you know. because there's so much work like you said poorly rehearsed but that to me means you did rehearse at least some and like all that writing and all that stuff like oh yeah something to just swing and miss like it's not like me putting a line in my phone and then saying that line in the middle of a bit and, and it not working. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was just something so that was, effort. yeah, it would have taken a lot more rehearsal. We definitely rehearsed as much as we had time to, but it just was so complicated and, and, and nuanced as far as like acting goes, like yeah. the acting is, is a lot of it. And we just didn't have the time to make those connections between the characters Mm-hmm. But uh, that takes work. It takes a lot more work than you that. Played the, uh, do, you think Steve? Recy- do you think recycling it into a, like, say there was a new location and you were going to do, could you redo them? Like, I would be willing like, to do that because like, I thought it was a good idea. Improve on them because yeah. they were clearly a start, you know, and, and like you said, maybe the follow through held you back a little to the final results. But what if you took everything you've learned in a year since? to improve it. It was a learning experience for sure, but I can also say I've walked an entire audience, so. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but they, again, like again, it's something, it, when I look back on my time in comedy, I'll regret a lot of the risks I didn't take, you know, mm-hmm. the time where like, I had the line in my head that I should have said, but I pulled back and didn't because I didn't want to like ruin a good crowd or didn't want to do this or that. Fuck it, man. I'm proud of you that you guys did it. And that, that brings me back to uh, that last tag that you added um, in your bit, you know, just the, the email you, you have to take those risks because the reward, that's my favorite moment is when I add that tag and it hits like on the spot. That's like, that's cathartic. That's, yeah, that's everything I want. This, you know, the, the that I like every reason why I do comedy. That tag to me was like a boxer. Like I had thrown all the punches I knew how to throw. Like everything I had practiced and rehearsed and trained for, I just couldn't land anything. And right before the bell rang and my time was up, I just threw a haymaker, and it was like enough to at least get me out. You know, like. With some dignity left. But um, yeah, I like that bit. The bit that that rabbit hash bit. I like that bit. I've done it for about five years and it, it was became a very, very different thing. And in the years that I perfected it, it got real long and then real short, real long again and real short. And it's helped me as a transition joke to other jokes about traveling, you know, it served every purpose. It's been my opening bit in small towns. It's been my closing bit in big cities. Like uh, it was a very utilitarian bit for me. And I think cause it, it was rooted in truth that I can adjust the story. I don't have to adjust the narrative. I could just change the story a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know? Cause I was there. I, I remember the story I lived. Right. You can mm-hmm. add that add that hypothetical character right, that, right. you know, right. I'm audience. never going to lose the root of the joke because that's the memory I have of, right, of the city, you know? So all, all the other stuff, just icing, it's just window dressing to make it more appealing to whatever neighborhood I'm in at the mm-hmm. time, you know? Mm-hmm. So would you, would you be confident in doing that bit everywhere? Like, would you do that at, at the improv if you were booked there? Yeah. Oh yeah. At this point. Yeah, Absolutely. And I know what, yeah, absolutely. And I know already, as soon as you, I was like, I wonder what he's going to say. Where haven't I done this bit? He said the improv, yeah, absolutely I would. And I know how I would make it work. I would be more silly in my act. Like I would act out a few things and be a little, I would make the joke more silly 
And then at the end, I would talk up the character. When I say the Hillary line, I would do it in a super country accent. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and then this fucking guy at the bar looks at me. It would just ran against the cat named Hillary. You know, like, uh, <laughs> you know, I would layer that part on more because that's what they will find funny more than the political aspect. Yeah. But and I, and I like you know everything you said about you know the root of the joke the truth in the joke is still there and that's I mean that that comes down to everything dealing with hecklers like um, you know adjusting your material for different audiences as long as there's a truth to it I think you can it's just practice on getting that connection creating that connection with the audience so right. all the good making- jokes are truthful you know it's just like the layers. You know, like that Bert Kreischer story. Yeah, I'm sure the machine, I'm sure not all that's true, but I'm sure some of it is like it came from somewhere, you know, Mm -hmm. and then he was able to turn to add the details to make it into a wildly entertaining bit, you know? Yeah. I mean, that really is. That's it. Too soon. Josh, is there anything else uh, that you wanted to add? Any uh, any tips, best advice you've ever gotten when it comes to like stand up, or or more specifically, kind of what we talked about today? I guess my biggest piece of comedy advice overall is that you should take the time to sit down and make a goal, make your goals for yourself, like what you're trying to accomplish in comedy. Because my goals and David's goals or Steve's goals, he talked a little bit about earlier. Like, um, I guarantee you our three goals could not have been more different for what we're doing this for, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, um, and you can't measure your success against somebody else's success because your goals aren't, you're not trying for the same target. You're not even trying to do the same task. You know, like we've all got different goals so don't get caught up in like like that because yeah. you're not even trying to get to the same place like you're racing to all different destinations than they are but if you don't determine that destination you're never going to get there right mm-hmm. yeah you have to you have to have an end point in mind yeah I don't there's know no right way to do it right but you got to have goals and, and direction just to be on the road you know that's all i wanted to do so my end was to get in good with liner i enjoy their comedy and I could be in a car with them for four days in a row. And I'm thankful I found Jeff Blanchard and me and him hit it off and he took me in and showed me all kinds of cool experiences and small towns and things. And that was my goal. And I got to achieve it by doing that. But like, if Jeff asked one of you two to go on the road, it, you would not enjoy it the way I did. It wouldn't be the same experience. I've you. done that once with you, and it was that experience <laughs> where it was like, all right, I, this is not my wheelhouse. <laughs> I can't. Right, yeah. And I've taken a lot of people, you know, Bruton and Jimmy and Mary, you know, mm-hmm. taking a lot for Chris Paul. Um, and it, you, you do figure out that, hey, maybe this mid-level feature road work isn't for me. You know, yeah. like uh, maybe you're a better club comic or a better all comic. That's fine. Just set a goal so you have something to work towards because otherwise you're just going to get eaten alive at open mics. Right, I pretty- think it's good to not try to be too universal because, I mean, it can be just a work and also impractical on top of many other Broad. things. You know, you can't just be like, I want to be successful. It's like, well, at what? At comedy. Cool. That doesn't narrow it down. Right, right. Specialize in something, you'll do way better. Be new, be unique. Try to be as unique as you can if you if you really want to yeah. stand out. Be you. You got to be truthful. I love the the quote. Uh, I'm paraphrasing it at this point. Sometimes you you reach the top of the ladder and realize it was propped yeah. against the wrong wall. You know, so just like being clear about really what you want. Was again like authentic and like truthful to you. Yeah, man. I think a lot of people, what you said about the ladder, I think a lot of people do that. And especially with money, like you're like, Oh, if I just made more money or, or if I just get this or I just get that, you know, um, I found that in my day job where I'm like, Oh, I just need to make more money. And then I worked at a car dealership where I made a lot of money and I realized like, ah, fuck, this kind of sucks. Really? Like I work 10, 12 hours a day to make this money, but like, I'm not happy with it. Else, you know, 
So like at that point, I had to like set a new goal. Like, oh no, I want to do the, I want to do something that's fun or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Like that's, if your goal is to be a club comic, then being at all open mics really isn't going to help you get there because it's not the same material. You know, you could learn from everything, but you're not going to hone material that's going to get you to where you want to be. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. you, you have more structured environment. Yeah. No, I, and I, I mean, narrow, I narrow that down on a nightly basis. Like if I get on stage, if I'm at an open mic, like I have a set that I'm going to do. I don't, I wing it as much as I can with the audience, but I, you know, I have my points that I want to hit. Like I want to work on this joke and I want to add this to this joke and see how that works. And I want to do this in this order. Like it's important to have not only like your long-term goal, but also your daily goals figured out. Otherwise you're just kind of like, swimming circles yeah right and and i think another mistake that i've seen a lot of people do is they get caught up in this like i'm gonna uh, perform constantly everywhere i could ever get on stage and i'm gonna do seven shows tonight or whatever and like if you do seven shitty shows and you didn't accomplish anything (laughs) like uh or if you did the exact same material the same way at all seven venues that day, then you really didn't accomplish anything. Like, you gotta learn from shit. And maybe you would have been better served putting all your effort into doing two of those shows really well. Yeah. You know, that bothers me uh, when I see a comic. It's like, you have, you've never gotten a laugh on that joke that way, yet you continue to say it the same way, like every time. What do you do? You're wasting your own time. But don't you love to the payoff when it does work for somebody? Like, oh, that's, um, the, that's the best. I, I, I do like, uh, I'm not throwing them under the buses. I really do like them. Brian Sternick had that joke about young thug, it, like making funny noises. So like at, when I first, I, love that. I really didn't know much about young thug, um, mm-hmm. even though I do listen to mostly hip hop, but over the time six or eight months i had heard some young thug songs and heard him make those noises and shit so the joke became funnier to me even though he still wasn't getting laughs with it per se Mm -hmm. and then i saw him at that dina's i headlined a show at dina's one night and there wasn't a lot of people there but brian went up and hosted and he got a huge laugh on that bit and it is like dude it made me so happy like happier than me doing good in my headlining set was just like seeing that joke work for him and he told it just right for that crowd in that moment and they really liked it and it was like crowd comedy big brother moment or whatever where i was, even though i never like had anything to do with it but i was like man good for you dude yeah. like, i'm so happy to see that finally pay off for you yeah mm-hmm. uh, it, it warms your heart <laughs> it does man uh, for a no, no less corny way to say it it does like i like to see y'all succeed you know that's another thing with comedy. There's plenty of room for all of us, man. Like, we're, again, we're all going for different goals. So our paths aren't the same. Like, no need to hate on anybody. If you're trying to run a show, talk to the other people that run shows the same night so that you could coordinate and you're not competing if you don't need to, you know? It's plenty to go around, man. Right. Dude, thank you so much for, for joining us on this. This was a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. I miss seeing you out. I miss seeing you on stage, but you know, best of luck with your new venture. That sounds exciting. Thanks, man. I'll send you guys a few pictures here when I'm done. And this first project is pretty cool. Oh yeah, man. August 1st, I'm launching plus fun motorsports um, here in Cleveland. I got a little shop on East 17th. Um, if you got anything fun, motorsports wise, cars, motorcycles, boats, jet skis, golf carts, scooters, Whatever you got that's cool, bring it to me and I will make it more fun. Plus fun motorsports. All right. Thank you. Plus fun motorsports.com, one eight five five plus fun motorsports. You can call me on the phone. Let's do this shit. Let's yeah, build something that fun. down. When, when you DM'd me and said, Yeah, you're starting a business, I was like, I'm gonna get his elevator pitch out of this out of this podcast. So I think that's it, man. Yeah. Wait till I send you this picture of this wild ass golf cart I'm building. It's nuts, man. Best of luck with that. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, yep. Nice seeing you, man. See you later, space cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for all of you uh, listening, especially this was a more comic centric episode, I feel like. Um, so, well, you know, when you're on stage, you don't get the reaction you want. 
can always, always find a way to laugh at that. And sometimes that will guide you to uh, the solution to whatever it is that you're working out on stage. So keep at it. Keep being funny. Let's keep making people laugh. Golden Ox Studios, home of Jeremy Demery, uh, who is just a gem of a human being. He does have a, a sword and he, he'll only use it if he needs to, but that's mostly to protect you as you're podcasting in the safety of his fortified studio. All professional great equipment. Jeremy is a professional, but he keeps it lighthearted. He's got CBD water if you want it. I don't know. And uh, <laughs> remember, it's Jeremy, not Jeremy. It's Jeremy. No. Don't say Jeremy. Jeremy. Jeremy Jeremy. Golden Ox Studios. Dot com. The logo will be on all the promos. Uh, so if you're looking to start a podcast or a Twitch stream, hit them up. Yeah. Golden Ox Studios for your Golden Ox needs. Just so you know, I wasn't correcting you. I was just saying, don't say Jeremy because it's like Jeremy, you know? Yeah. Golden so Ox like, Studios. Don't we don't want care. <laughs> it's clean, sanitary, sanitary uh, yeah. Demery. If you'd like to weigh in on today's topic, follow us on Twitter at You Can't Laugh Pod or like us on Facebook at You Can't Laugh at That and tell us how you did laugh at today's topic or how you didn't. This is all about the conversation, is what I'm saying. All right. Bye.